Welcome to Olympian Method, the show where we ask the deep questions in philosophy. But we need your help in finding the deep answers. So please like, subscribe, and hit that bell notification. Well, Sean, well, here well, we are again. Uh, here another, we are. another chapter in the discussion on uh, freedom and free will and decisions and all these deterministic type, type of stuff. So we talked about determinism a little bit in the uh, last segment, mm -hmm. last chapter rather. And I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the um, sort of determinism and decision making as it relates to neurobiology. Okay. So there have been some experiments that have been done. You may actually, I, mean, you, you, I think you know more about biology than I do, actually, as a matter of fact, because that's part of your background, right? Well, you've been listening to Sam Harris, who's a cognitive neuroscience, and he knows more than I do. So That's, that's, that's true. He has, he has some great contributions. We'll, we'll probably be linking his discussion of free will because it's very relevant to the, the topic we're talking about here. Absolutely. Yeah. So you're aware of experiments that have been conducted with regards to decision making and a lot of time, I, I, I don't know all the variations on this, but there'll be different experiments where someone has to choose between say doing something like with the left hand or right hand or whatever the decision is and there'll be an experimenter that will record sort of the when the, the, EG. The, the EEG will record what the brain activity was that's going on with and in, in relation to when the conscious decision was made right and they'll find that usually there's like anywhere from a half a second to even more uh, is where the brain activity occurred before the conscious decision that corresponds to that that's interesting do you do you think that sort of Sam Harris was making the claim that's that overrides any assertion of free will but what if that's just the underlying me mechanism of how free will operates? Could you elaborate on mechanism in that context? So every, one thing I was struck with, by the way, every time, every time I listen to Sam Harris speak, I have to pause it after a minute of listening to him talk. Because <laughs> very, very dense. Very dense. And the presenter uh, agreed, agreed with that assertion as well. Yeah. If, if, if people are making decisions in a way unconsciously before they make conscious decisions that just seems to me that it doesn't imply that free will doesn't exist but that maybe what is free will exists in the unconscious space right so we talked a little bit about what makes freedom and what makes a decision and usually we have this notion that it's all happening in our conscious mind. Mm -hmm. And I think part of that is just, like I was saying before, is the limitation of how we think in right. general. Mm -hmm. um, and we also can only really um, account for so much of actual causality when it comes to our decisions and our actions and those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, it's entirely possible that, that, like I was saying before, there's, there's certain autonomous things that are happening in your, in your body. Like mm -hmm. for example, your, your heart's beating, your breathing, those types of things. And you can control, you can have some influence on them consciously as well. But like there's, let's just go even more basic, like the cellular functions that are happening that you're not ever in, that you're not ever like thinking about, but that your brain is still involved in coordinating and making them happen. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that there's actually, there's, most of what's actually driving your life then in, in like that view is happening unconsciously. And some of those things, some of those processes that are happening unconsciously are then elevated to the level of being conscious awareness, mm -hmm. but that necessarily because of how that process works there, that that's sort of happening after the actual decision is made in a, in a sense, right? Right. Well, because I, the center of the brain where you have the pineal gland, and that's not the only part of the brain that's responsible for making these decisions like the beating heart and the breathing, but I think all of the decisions kind of start from that point in the middle and kind of emanate outward. Yeah, it's it's not like it's it's not like the the functions in the outer regions of my brain, like the neocortex, are affecting how my heart rate is functioning. Although uh, Wim Hof, who's a meditation expert, he consciously decides to go into cold water, frigid water. <laughs> Because he knows how it affects his biology mm -hmm. at a cellular level. Right. He, he does do this breathing exercise in tandem with that because he knows how the breathing energizes the body and it actually creates a sort of uh, improves the immune system. He, he was injected with a virus, an E. coli, not virus, E. coli bacteria um, that was considered dangerous and potentially lethal. And he didn't show any symptoms. He did it as an experiment to show the validity of his breathing exercise, mm. even without cold, cold treatment. So I do think there's a certain level is once you become aware of that, your unconscious mind is where your decision making patterns go. You can actually choose to try and interact with that in a way that improves your life. And 
this is where my shoehorn of dreams comes into play. Go ahead. Because I think dreams is a very important psychoanalytic aspect of, of our, well, it's, a, it's an aspect of our minds that has been studied by many psychoanalysts. And I think it's valid to this discussion because do we choose to dream? And I think there's a, there's a gray area with that yeah. because you can lucid dream too. Right. In addition to just having a dream that you remember, you can actually lucid dream. You can be aware that you're in a dream space. You can, you can, that is where you can fly. And I, I think a lot of psychologists have, have also talked about the dream space being another area where the, uh, the un, either unconscious or subconscious thoughts are sort of rising to the level of consciousness, right? Right. And that, but that, that makes sense. And I think that's why people like Carl Jung and Sigmund Freud spent so much time on dream analysis because they realized that, yeah, it is coming from the structures deep in, deeper in the mind that we aren't conscious of. But it's actually where maybe our consciousness is like starting from. Mm -hmm. We're not. We're, it's it's like you're seeing the edges of the tree, but you're not seeing the roots. Or you're seeing the tree, but you're not seeing the roots. Right. So it's like, is the tree? The and it's, tree it's also like I think some, a lot of our decision making processes are built into that because those systems are older. They can react faster. They they can handle like responding to threats and things like that. So right. I think necessarily that's where a lot of our decision making actually happens. The reptilian cortex, which is, you know, they call it that because that's a part of the brain that you know, we, we, have, we share in commonality with re reptilian like, like creatures. The lizard brain, I sometimes the li <laughs> They call it the lizard brain. I, my <laughs> friends and I kind of call it the monkey brain, where it's like all the impulsive desires to. Does that make all of us lizard people? No, nah, I think it kind of does. It, we can actually get. That's a really interesting thought experiment. <laughs> I actually uh, I, I don't particularly subscribe to the literal theory of lizard people, but metaphorically, I think it's helpful to think of all human beings as being like lizard people mm. in a way. And to think of. Um, and, and, it's, and it's, what's really interesting is it's like you think about people who are, um, have a poor connect, like in the addiction model that I was giving out, where they have a poor connection between the neocortex and their right. lower structures, you know, impulsive, kind of unhinged. They're more animalistic. Mm -hmm. So, but it's, what, what defines a conscious and unconscious process? It's hard to say because it's like, I'm not choosing to look at that light right now necessarily <laughs> consciously. I don't have right. like an intention behind it. I think intention, something that comes to mind is intention. Mm. Like when you think about conscious processes and freedom of will, there's this word called intent. So if, if, if I'm choosing to take a walk because it's a nice day outside, is that the limit of my intent? Or is it because there's a deeper biological aspect that's like, man, I'm tired. I haven't moved. I need to move to get like the blood flowing for health reasons for, you know, yeah, I preservation that, of self, you yeah. know? To me, intent and will are kind of wrapped up in, in a large, to a large degree. And it, it, it comes down to, again, like pointing yourself or having a particular direction that you are desiring to go in or like a meta want even in, in large degree. It's, it's like an outcome or a goal or whatever that is not necessarily, in order for it to be an intent, it's, it's not just what you're currently doing, but it's kind of like your, it's like your vision for the future. It is, yeah, I, I agree. <sighs> It, it kind of, it, but it, how can you aim at something that you aren't aware exists? That's the kind of a circles back to the original question that you asked in an earlier chapter. Yeah, why wouldn't you be aware it exists? Well, like, well, I, I was thinking about like, um, if you have like, say that you have like an a, ideal um, self, but you're not, you're not able to properly visualize all the ways that you could be great. Mm -hmm. For example, it's kind of like you have the potential to learn French, but you don't know French right now. Correct. So it's like you can think of what it would be like to speak that language of French or any language, but you don't know it. And it's kind of a similar thing when you're at, thinking about what to aim your, aim your life at or, what, or how you want your life to be. It's like you can kind of have a sense of what it would be like to, to be successful or, you, or to be morally good or to be like important or to be powerful. Mm -hmm. We have these ideas of what that looks like, but we don't actually have the knowledge of those things yet. Mm. And so I think, I think free will actually is implies is not possible without some knowledge of limitations of what you can and can't do. Because mm. I think if you have knowledge of your limitations, you actually know what to, what you can strive for. Does that make any sense? Like I can't lift, I can't deadlift 300 pounds, but if I wanted to aim at that, I know it's possible. Because mm. I see other people do it. Right. So I think we kind of rely on each other as like a, of, a, as a way of kind of gauging like what, what kind of will do we want to bring into the world? Does that make any sense? Kind of, yeah, kind of. I guess I, I'm trying to I'm trying to think of the follow up question I want to ask on that because I, I do want to d unpack it. Um, yeah, a little bit deeper. So, um, 
Oh, here's here's a here's a good que- here's a good question for you. So um, you you have a glass of water there, right? Yes. Do you freely choose to drink the water? Is that of your free will? Well, it would, it's bad optics for the podcast to and because I have a boom mic, you'd probably be able to hear me swallow. So it's probably I, I'm I'm aware that what everything I'm doing creates sound, but it's like my body has needs, and it's like hmm, everything kind of needs water to live. So. Hopefully you didn't hear that, but <laughs> maybe I, I, I think it was instinctual though. Like as you were thinking about what you wanted, what follow-up question you wanted to ask, it was an instinct of I'm thirsty. Right. And if you, if you weren't thirsty, could you freely choose to drink it or would you not even, would that thought not ever cross your mind? I mean, that's like asking the question. It's like, I mean, would I, would I ever put pins and needles in my, in my finger just to, to, to feel pain? You know, it's almost kind of like a masochist thing. I could keep drinking water until I explode, you know? So I don't, th- so. But I, so it, it comes back to their. If know. I didn't have that need, like, if, like if, if, if I could just do things and ignore my biology completely, it would be counterproductive to survival. Right. I Drinking was, water when I don't need water could actually be harmful to me. I was going to say that's why it necessarily has to live within a set of limitations. Mm-hmm. Because if you just, if, if, if freedom just meant acting on, like being able to act in any way at any time, that would not lead to a well structured life or society or anything really. I would lead, lead, actually, I think that's what state of, state of nature would be mm-hmm. in a Hobbesian sense, but that's it's political philosophy, neither here nor there. Yeah, but so I, I guess my, my next follow up question for you is what, so if, to what degree do you believe your basic desires, your, your unconscious uh, biology and everything, all the neuroscience stuff we were talking about, to what degree does that drive your decisions? And to what degree does your conscious mind drive your decisions? That's a great question. I like to think of it like this, actually. The conscious mind is... is furthest from to the edge of, of the brain as, as possible, right? Right. So it's closest to being sort of like an outside observer. Okay. It's easier to look in almost than it is to kind of look look out, I think, I think in a way. Like it, I, maybe that's not entirely true, but just for the purpose of what I'm what I'm saying here is like I can meditate on and think about what my desires and my wants are. Mm-hmm. If that makes any sense. Yeah. So, that makes sense. I can also cho- choose to consciously ignore them, and and I and I think that is if I'm choosing to consciously ignore them, it's probably as a result of some sort of connectivity issue between what's deeper in my mind versus what's outside the mind. Mm. So I think you can look at determinism and causality in terms of the mind and how we think as being if the channel is blocked in any way, like say you have Alzheimer's or something like that, or you have Parkinson's or you've got a brain tumor or, you know, God forbid you have syphilis in this day and age and it wasn't treated, you know, you'll, you'll go insane. Mm-hmm. Sorry, Nietzsche, you know, <laughs> it did happen to him. Yeah. Really, really tragic. But the, if, if, if you've accounted for sort of those structural anomalies in the mind in making that decision and, and someone's choosing to still make maybe bad decisions for themselves in terms of their own survival, it, it's, I don't know if I don't know of any cases that exist, but in that hypothetical scenario, it would be puzzling for me, because it, it's like when you think about back to depression, you know, people have a real flaw in their neurochemistry, right? And sometimes that leads in extreme cases to people, you know, taking their own life, which is awful. You know, I don't even like bringing that up, but it is a possibility that we have to contend with on a day to day basis. Yeah. And you know, a person who's healthy and in a structural sense of the mind, where the mind's very connected and they're not they're not disconnected, let's just say, then no people in that state of mind really choose to do that. It's almost as a result of that flawed structure in the brain that people choose to do that. Mm. Or vice versa, like if someone chooses to, um, in in the Sam Harris lecture, if someone chooses to murder somebody, you can almost guarantee that to be a combination of the the structure of their mind at the place, at, at the time that they made the decision, all of the events that preceded that mm-hmm. in their life. But not only that, all the events that preceded them, their life was also, there was also all of these other people's actions that were inadvertently, you know, influencing that person's life and the lives around that person's life, et cetera, et cetera. So it's all kind of 
interconnected. And I think that's what makes free will, free will so hard to discern is that you have a combination of will and life all kind of interacting with each other, mm -hmm. not just within our own biology, but as a society. Like I'm interacting with you, you're interacting with me, right. but we go to other people and we interact with them. Who knows something we say and do to somebody might be the causal factor and tipping point that gives them a culminating insight and a realization into the meaning of life. Or maybe it sets them over the edge into a dark, deep existential despair. You know, and there's two paths that can go as a result of that. And that's just a hypothetical. So, but did we choose which of those paths we go down or is that just a result of the environment we're in? It can be a result of the environment. It can, well, okay, so this is a really contentious thing because I'm gonna talk about intelligence briefly. Okay. And in, in, in that intelligence they have found based on, a, I believe it was a Harvard study, could be wrong about that, but they found that it's either 65 or 70 percent of intelligence is genetic. Okay. So that doesn't seem very controversial. It doesn't seem controversial, but for some people, like maybe in the, in the social social sciences, it, it would be because they tend to believe that things are more. I mean, I, I know that the, the mind is extremely uh, plastic, or plastic, or however they use the term. So it, it obviously it's has the ability to grow or to you know um, improve itself a large degree over your life. Right, right. But something that kind of comes to mind is is there are ways of modifying your intelligence. There's also ways of sabotaging it. For example, if you grow up in a country where you have very poor sanitation of water. Yeah. Very poor country. And, and uh, I, I think one of the UFC fighters, Yoel Romero, grew up in Cuba, and he actually remembers there being um, very, very poor water conditions. And it mm -hmm. actually brings him to tears to this day. But anyways, like if you're living in that environment and you don't have access to clean water or food, it has a developmental impact on your brain. It has to. Right. Because you're being exposed to all of these pathogens, these microbes that are toxic and can kill you. I mean, it happens, it's in Africa all the, t all the time. They have awful, and all over the world, drink, awful drinking water. I mean, in Texas, it's happening. They don't have access to some of the amenities that mm. are um, just because of the cold snap. But anyway, yeah. to, to get to the point of, there's so many variables at play in determining anything that we are confined and limited to what we can perceive the variables to be. Yeah. And we cannot make a judgment about any one person's decision outside of our ability to perceive the factors that influence that decision. So I have a theory about this, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, going, going back to the, the whole notion of we have certain autonomous processes that, that run in our body, sort of the, the cells just doing their thing and we're not having to think about them consciously, right? Mm -hmm. And then we have certain things that happen consciously. And so my philosophy or my, my theory here is that decisions are actually happening at, you know, like we're, we're using various parts of our brain to make these decisions, right? Mm -hmm. And what I, what I think is happening is that we, we can only devote different parts of our brain to different, like we only have, we have very limited when it comes to our conscious brain power, right? right? It can only be directed at a small set of things at once and different right. theories uh, about that. But let's just say that it is necessarily more limited than our overall brain capacity to think, right? Okay. So I think that in some ways free will or just the the will itself is it's it's necessarily focusing our that brain power on whatever thought whatever whatever processes or actions or thoughts are going to be the most beneficial for our like evolution it's like a survival type of mechanism mm -hmm. and so by focusing on that those set of call them decisions, if you will, because I mean, all these are essentially being decided by the brain overall. Right. But by focusing on those, that subset of them has like evolutionarily wise or biolog biologically speaking has been, um, been, been what is sort of uh, what has led to our ability to uh, build up better survival, better fitness over time. And so, so, so as, as a survival mechanism, it's sort of like been built into our biology just as a result of focusing like that part of our brain that can do things like rational thinking and reason and logic and those sorts of things on a very small subset of uh, our reality and our perception. And so by focusing mm -hmm. on just those things, it has led to um, outcomes that have benefited us over time. Does that, does that make sense? Right, like almost like our, does, does the notion of, of sacrificing a little bit of pain in the now for, for the benefit of the future, does, is that kind of 
not synonymous, but commensurate with what you're saying? That's a part of what I'm saying. Yeah. So that the ability to think in those ways has led to our like improved fitness for survival over time. But if we were to be using that same bro that same brain power to be questioning like all the decisions our body was making about like you know the, these cells should be doing this thing like basically mm -hmm. we, we would we would end up trying to micromanage ourselves and we would we would essentially like make no progress so we have to focus on just those mm -hmm. decisions just those actions of the brain that are going to lead to the best chance or best improvements in our fitness to survive over time right right so i think that by having that focus it's sort of it's but because because that focus happens to be where our our own conscious thought process happens mm -hmm. we sort of we have this sort of this oversimplification again it's like an abstraction except in this case it's like a much more severe abstraction and in some ways it's it's kind of like a um i don't i don't want to use the wrong term here but it's 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 a it's a useful fiction in some ways. A useful fiction, yeah. Yeah, I call it a useful illusion, but yes, yeah, same thing. Calling it an illusion, fiction, whatever you want to call it, but it's it, but but I mean, it's not an illusion in that there's no ability to affect these with our mental processes because I think that's where the decisions get made. Mm -hmm. The illusion is the fact that all of the decision making is happening only in this one part of our brain. But right. the, reason, the reason we've evolved that is to sort of manage the problem that is life that is way too big to fit in that one space, right? Well, think it's like decentralized command, right? Like mm -hmm. in, in the event that say maybe there's something wrong with say an organ in your body, you have these pain sensors that can detect that pain. You're like, oh, something's wrong with my liver or something is wrong with my, my spleen or something like yeah. that. And, 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 and so the conscious mind can become aware of that and be like, okay, there, that's a problem. I need to figure out what that is. What do I do? Well, in our society, you go to a doctor, right? right? But you know, but but that I think th those types of sensations are only elevated for a small portion. Like pain is definitely one of the sensations that gets elevated from the unconscious or subconscious mind to the conscious because it's a signal to us that mm -hmm. something's going wrong. Whereas we don't necessarily perceive everything in our bodies that's going right all the time, or that would just be too much sensation, right? Right. Exactly. And, and, and it'd be, there'd be no filter in, in perception. Yeah. I think I mentioned in a previous episode how people who are like highly autistic, they actually have problems with that filtering. And right, that processing. and that, that, that's a good analogy. I think free will is in some ways, it's a filter on our experiences down to only those which we include in our conscious mind. Mm -hmm. And that, that helps us bias us in a way that, that moves us in a good direction, it sort of gives us that will in a sense. Right, and I guess the other pragmatic question after that is, which direction do we move into? Well, exactly. <laughs> like, how do we, how do we want to plan our futures? How do we want to? Uh, what do we want to give to other people? And what do, what do we want? What do we want to have for ourselves? You know, what what kind of community and and security do we want to have as a result of of, of planning that sort of thing? Right. And I think that's that's survivally in, embedded in us too. And that kind of goes back to a previous episode we did on morality. Yeah. Where it's like mor morality is anything that. Anything that's immoral in a, in a purely individualistic sense is anything that limits your own survival. But because we live the way our society like works, we we rely on other people, and so anything that violates the trust or betrays the people around us is is counter to our survival. But not only that, it's counter to theirs because if they lose trust in us, they they they're like, well, maybe there is some benefit this person can give to me, but I don't trust them anymore, mm -hmm. so I can't rely on them to give me the benefit that I was normally relying on them for yeah and, and it actually shorthands them too but they make a judgment decision this person betrayed me i have to cut them out of my life completely because if i kept them around they might betray me again mm. so, so yeah so, so to wrap things up i think ultimately we have less free will than we think at first glance mm -hmm. but i think that there's still like there's there's obviously a value in think in in the thought process that leads to us having the perception of free will because that's a large part of what allows us to move in a particular direction or to have that sort of bias for action built in because if you don't believe you have free will then that sort of leads to a, like the, the fatalistic approach we were talking before where you start to it's it's, it's also like sort of a form of nihilism where it's like nothing yeah. matters anymore i'm just but that's what's funny about that is you're actually you know in some sense you're making a choice to do that and that choice is going to be detrimental to your fitness to survive so right the belief in the free will is even if it's like a reductionist sort of you know useful fiction type of thing the usefulness is in that it builds us a, it, it builds within us that drive that desire to move in a particular direction okay maybe it's more helpful to think about free will as conscious will mm. 
Maybe there's a difference. And then there's the unconscious will and the conscious will. Maybe. Let's, let's leave it there for this time, though. All right. That's a good start. It's Anything? been a great talk. Great talk, sir. Later, Olympians. Later.